Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of Pottywood, the podcast where we talk about movies and all kinds of movie related stuffs, uh, occasionally with a half working video featuring my colleague, um, who I'll introduce in a second, because god damn it, the amount of money that we're paying this goddamn website every month, you'd think the video would be working! <laughs> Don't you just love it? Okay, well, I am one of your co-hosts, Steve Hester, and somewhere over there, maybe, in a haze of uh, missynced audio video is... That would be me, Andrew Roger Carson, and yes, they are giraffes. Yes, they're certainly having one. Yeah, and yeah, uh, apologies for the people who tuned in for the last wave of episodes that we've had this season. There has been problems uh with the sync in my audio and video uh we do not know why i actually no. have the strongest internet out of everyone else um we cannot figure out these problems we have been back and forth to riverside to try and figure out what this problem is we're getting no answer they're like oh you need to buy a better camera well we bought, well, we bought a better, a better camera. camera and it's still not working no. um We've done everything. We have reset the routers. I have called uh, my internet providers and, you know, what is going on. Um, and everything is fine on my end. But there is some problem with Riverside. We don't know what it is. We are currently looking into the avenue of trying out a different recording platform for these episodes to see how it goes. Because it has been going on for five episodes now. Yeah. And... It doesn't no, look good, it, basically, but it's 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 out of our control. We keep trying to do it as best we can, but even even recently, we lost uh, we lost Cyrus Forrest. He was supposed to be joining us for for a yes. recent episode, and then it it all it all went pear shaped. And we can't be doing that. We need to be bringing you. And yes, I'm getting my finger deadly close to the camera. We need to be bringing you decent content. So we're going to be looking into fixing it. Yes. And uh, before we start on this week's episode, we want to ask you, would you subscribe to Pottywood in the, uh, the button down here? Yeah. Uh, Steve will put the, uh, the Monty Python finger pointing to exactly where you need to subscribe. Uh, the subscriptions help us. You could have subscribed, then unsubscribed, then resubscribed several times by now. Exactly. So please do that. Bill Daly did it twice. We actually got a double bill. And speaking yes. of double bill, Steve... Oh, uh, we've got to go into what's in the box for this week to kind of start us off. And obviously with our new format now, because you're skiving two weeks of the month. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we like to think. We gave you the what's in the box now. You're going to have two movies to review. And uh, I think we'll start off, obviously, with the first one that was pulled out last week. It were, was 2006's Sherry Baby. Yes. Well, this is from 2006. <laughs> No, 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 I said 2006. Go away, 2007 alarm. You're not wanted this week. It stars uh, Maggie Gyllenhaal, uh, Giancarlo Esposito, and of course, Danny Trejo, man, yes. As, uh, Known as his Tuesday job. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it, uh, it, is, it, is, it is a concurrent theme between both this and... And the Wonder Boys that we're going to get into uh, in in a few minutes. That the there is a theme running through the both of them of people that are ultimately searching for personal redemption, not from the world around them, but mostly from themselves, accepting themselves and accepting their failings and everything. Um, and there's also a superhero connection. Uh, I, I am sick of these conversations now where people say, "Oh, how many superheroes are from Marvel are in?" this movie or how many DC people are in this movie. So like, can't it just be a movie? Yeah. But just you we wait until we get onto the movie. wonder boys. We've got a yeah. list and a half for that one. But anyway, Sherry baby. Yes. It's uh, it's the story of uh, a woman called Sherry who has just got out of prison after spending a stint in there, after committing a number of crimes to fund her drug habit. She's out. She wants to get clean. She wants to get back into her daughter's life. And in doing so, she finds a load of obstacles in a way, most noticeably ones which she's put up there for herself with her own attitude and the way that she's reacting to the world around her. But there is also a number coming from the people that are surrounding her. Uh, for example, from her 
parole officers, from uh, her sister-in-law's family, particularly her sister-in-law. That's that's kind of me ham-fistingly explaining this, but it, the, the thing is about this film is that you have very, very competent actors in it. Uh, Maggie Gyllenhaal is great as Sherry. Uh, scene steal. She is absolutely fantastic in this role. Uh, Giancarlo Esposito, which, which was before he became famous as Gustavo Fring in Breaking Bad. This was before then. Um, and, of course, Danny Trejo, they, they, they are wonderful. And it's nice to see Danny Trejo in a role where he is not just a bandido. He's <laughs> seriously playing against type. This is yeah. the nicest Danny Trejo you will ever see in a movie. The problem that I have with the movie is I just don't like the protagonist i You're don't like to. sherry i i she she opposite she operates from this position as being all sweet and innocent and then every available opportunity she will just drop a knickers to get what she thinks she wants you know she she goes to a job agency and the guy say no we can't get you into a your dream job of looking after kids because of this that and the other First thing that she does, bends over, shows him her bum, and then up comes the top for not the first time in the film. That then carries on throughout the movie. She's frequently uh, giving in to bouts of temper. And I, I I can understand that this is probably like a more realistic take as to how someone would get out of prison after spending time in rehab and everything, but... I just didn't feel any sympathy for her. I didn't warm to her. I, I, I found the movie to be pretty stark and a bit depressing, really. And especially when there is a very, very uncomfortable scene, which I did actually catch. Got my little notebook here. I caught early when her dad, after crying on his shoulder, this is her dad in the film, puts his hand down her top and feels her up. Now, I yes. knew, I I could feel it. I could feel because of the way that he was acting around her in an earlier scene that he was going to be an abusive dickhead, and he was. That never gets brought up. It never gets addressed. There is no comeuppance for him, and there is still the lingering threat that her daughter, who, who throughout it all, the way that she was acting actually reminds me of my youngest, um, her daughter is just going to fall foul of this nasty little pervert, just like her mum did. None of that is addressed. So after this whole movie just left me with a very sour taste in my mouth. I, I wasn't, I, I didn't hate it, but I just wasn't enjoying it at all. I could appreciate it for what it was. I could appreciate the work that was going into it. I could appreciate the performances, but I just didn't enjoy it. Well, yeah, that is fair enough. It's, it's kind of like that shotgun stories uh, element. Kind of going back, it is a very kind of grounded... Mm. Uh, based it's on the uh, the director of this, uh, I love the director of this. Her name is uh, Laurie Collier. Uh, she's a director out of New Jersey. So obviously with a film set in New Jersey, it mm-hmm. kind of makes sense. Uh, she directed movies like uh, uh, No Can Dream, uh, Trapped, The Secret Life of Marilyn Monroe as well. So she does do very serious uh, character study movies. And... I think the saving grace of this movie is Maggie Gyllenhaal's performance because it mm. is it is an absolutely tremendous uh, performance and it's not a redemption story at all. This is not like a, a girl who's gotten out who is like changed and wants to prove to the people that you know she has changed. She still has all of these problems going on. When watching the film this week, I realized that there are a lot of scenes in there that kind of don't have a singular point. No. Uh, being in the movie. it's They were more of a way of just showcasing what white trash America was. Yeah. And there was a definite yeah. emphasis on the white trash. Oh, yes. Yes, definitely. Uh, there is no humor in this movie whatsoever. No. So if you're thinking coming, you're coming in and watching something like No Hard Feelings, uh, you're going to come out with your feelings hurt. Uh, it's as straight as it can be. Uh, there is no music score in this movie either. No, no, there isn't. And it reminds me a lot of the Ryan Gosling movie that came out the same year, actually, called Half Nelson. Right. Uh, which was another independent movie. 
where uh, he played a school teacher who was a drug abuser as well. He was an addict. And those kind of two movies kind of go together. If I was going to recommend this movie to anyone, it'd be if you're a fan of Maggie Gyllenhaal and you've not seen this movie, you have to see this movie. Uh, don't expect a uh, smooth ride with it. No, no, because it isn't. It's uh, it is moments of very, very cringy unpleasantness, and there's there's some times where you just want someone to say no to her. You know, people just seem to is people just seem to kind of give in to her and her, her demands, and and it, you just it's like the scene where Danny Trejo comes around and she just has adds him to her list of conquests in my head i was just going no 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 don't do this don't oh no he's it's too late too late so yeah that that was that was basically my my five quid on that one really i would save my two cents but the inflation's way too high for that at the moment <laughs> well luckily um you had another film to kind of lighten the mood and it was 2000s uh, Curtis Hansen movie Wonder Boys. Yes. Uh, now I did enjoy this one more, uh, possibly because of it did have more humour, dark dark humour, but you know it still had uh, had humour in there. Um, the the story follows uh, a writing professor, uh, played by Michael Douglas, who has a gifted student in his class and he's struggling uh, this is Michael Douglas uh, he's struggling to finish off his novel and finds that this young kid is able to just spaff out words and stories with just consummate ease and Robert Downey Jr. comes into the, the fold as uh, as his agent. You've got Toby Maguire as playing his young lad. Um, you've got Katie Holmes as his lodger, who is uh, very underused in this movie. She kind of like pops up in about three scenes, and then that's it. Yeah. Um, uh, you've got Francis McDormand as his uh, his love interest, who happens to be married. To John Boy Walton. I know. Weren't you also in Battle Beyond the Stars? Does your species have kissing? Oh, yes. We have that. Um, I think you were, <laughs> old chum. Now, that was a deep cut that you weren't expecting, wasn't it? More amazed the fact that we found one other film that uh, John Boy Wong was in. <laughs> um, yeah, so there is more humour in this. It's it's about a man who is trying to to claw himself out of this this rut, this depression that he's been in, this life that he doesn't even feel like he properly belongs to anymore. Same as with Sherry Baby, um, uh, and it does have some quite amusing moments. Like there's there is a dog which gets shot early on, um, completely negating Hollywood's thing about not killing the dog. But this one is actually quite funny. Um, and it's a constant joke throughout the whole movie as this dog is just resting in the back of his car throughout the whole thing. Um, and yeah, I am going to bring this up. It's the superhero connection. <laughs> Maggie Gyllenhaal took over the role from Katie Holmes in uh, The Dark Knight. Iron Man playing the agent to Ant-Man and who is playing the mentor to Spider-Man. <laughs> Then Alan Tudyk shows up, who by himself has got the list of accolades. He, I went through IMDb <laughs> because I wanted to check which ones he'd done. He was Alfred in an audio podcast. He was in the TV DC TV show Doom Patrol. He was in The Tick. He played the Green Arrow across multiple formats. And he was even in Deadpool 2. That is just a few of his things. It is a superhero smorgasbord. Um... But I am very, very glad to see that it doesn't entirely fall into a number of the tropes that it does have. There is a gun featured in it, and it, I was thinking, oh, that's going to become a Chekhov's gun moment at the end. And it kind of was, but it doesn't really affect the ending. Um, and then throughout the whole movie, uh, Michael Douglas keeps having these blackouts. Possibly linked to his uh, his uh, marijuana usage. Possibly not. But then there's a bit at the end where he drops down a bag of weed thinking, I'm going to give this up. 
kind of teeters on a uh, on a balcony rail. And then you think, no, 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 don't fall off. You were doing so well up till this point. Don't end on a cliche. Don't pull the lost ending to clerks on this. No. Fortunately, he doesn't. Is all that stuff true about Errol Flynn? How he used to put paprika on his dick to make it, you know, like more stimulating. Christ, Traxer, how the hell should I know? Well, I love Alan Tudyk. I really do. He's he's so funny, and he just seems he to is. do those roles just effortlessly. Uh, um, did you enjoy the film? Uh, I did. Um, I can't see me running back to it anytime soon. Some people did run back to it, so I, of which I will explain. So obviously, uh, the movie is directed by the late great Curtis Hansen, who you will know as the director of *L.A. Confidential*. Uh, in her shoes, uh, the hand that rocks the cradle, if you want to go back that far. And of course, Eight Mile with Eminem. <laughs> Which people kind of forget that movie exists, but it's there. It's out there. Um, oh, speaking of the kind of LA confidential uh, link, did you spot the James Elroy cameo? Uh, no, but I did spot the Rob McElhenney cameo. Yes. Uh, well, Rob McElhenney actually had uh, a lot of his scenes greatly reduced he was in it a lot more in the original cut and oh did he have lines oh yeah he had quite a lot oh right yeah he was a love final... interest for katie holmes character and he had a few significant scenes but apparently he was told right. by Curtis Hansen, uh yeah your scenes are getting uh cut out That's how it works in hollywood man uh this hollywood. film was originally released in uh february 2000 Okay. okay, and it was released to critical praise. They loved it, uh, but hardly any box office whatsoever. It's severely lost shitloads of money. Um, Paramount did something very different that they never do. They actually re-released it later again that year with a different marketing campaign, and it was in a bid to gain Oscar buzz about right. it. And it did fare a little bit better but not totally better. It, it is kind of listed as a box office bomb, um, which is a shame. I think mm. in total it made $33 million and had a $55 million budget. So it didn't perform well. It got nominated for the Oscars. Bob Dylan's song got nominated. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't uh, honestly <laughs> think that that was Bob Dylan. I, I don't yeah. know who I thought it was. I just didn't sound like Bob Dylan. He sounded awake. But yeah, yeah. The, the, I remember the first marketing campaign of this movie, it was terrible and it was the poster of just michael douglas there looking like elmer fudd and then they kind of re-released it later with pictures of downey jr katie yeah. holmes toby Maguire, and and made it more of like more seem like a, a an ensemble cast so which it is yeah it uh, is but yes uh getting back to it, james elroy yeah he does have a cameo during uh the first party scene uh obviously with him being the uh, writer of LA Confidential and Curtis Hansen directing that. Mm -hmm. uh, that obviously works. I feel you, you cannot resist this movie once it starts. I, I think you really do get sucked into it. And uh, you, you kind of fall for these characters. I think it's probably the, the bold statement coming up. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's possibly one of Michael Douglas's best ever performances. Definitely one of his better ones. You know, the character's more even. He's, he's more kind of likeable yeah i think you could have a wonder boys drinking game uh every time you see a bridge how many bridges are in his movies like bridge 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 it's like every bridge in pittsburgh is in this movie i was every honestly thinking bridge. about them being a drinking game that you could do with sherry babies every time she lights up a cigarette oh she, god she was god. puffing on those cancer sticks all throughout the movie uh paramount pictures who were the distributor of this movie um, they weren't interested in it. Uh, it was pitched to them a number of times. The only time they became interested was when Michael Douglas himself said, you know, he, he stepped on board, he lowered his usual fee. Uh, we've got to mention Robert Downey Jr. This was before Iron Man. This was even before Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. Yes. But uh, I think he was on probation during this movie. I was going to say <laughs> this would have been round about his proper burnout. Oh yeah, he, he was, was actually on probation for this movie. 
Uh, he had to do a lot of convincing of the producers and Curtis Hansen as well. Apparently, they, they had to go to dinner, he had to talk, they had to make promises and everything. And he was incredibly well behaved throughout this movie, um, throughout the entire shooting of it. And then uh, as soon as he got back to Los Angeles, he violated his parole. <laughs> so at least he managed to get through the movie. Yes. Which is the main thing. Um, for the year 2000, I think this is probably one of the better movies of that year. You know what it reminded um, me of? A number of times. Um, not necessarily the content, but like the, the tone, particularly with the the kind of slightly dark humour and the soundtrack. It reminded me a lot of American Beauty. Had that kind of yeah. almost almost fairy tale esque feel to it. Just that ever so yeah. slight touch. Could be something. Yeah, different. you know, it's it's kind of a good follow on, I guess. Uh, for people who liked American Beauty, they'd probably like this. Mm. Uh I'd recommend this for people who love Frances McDormand because she is great in it. Um, if you're a Robert Downey Jr. fan uh, and were interested in his career before he was Iron Man, uh, you will enjoy this. Mm -hmm. If you love Michael Douglas and who doesn't, you know you will enjoy this. And I think even Tobey Maguire fans. Uh, yes. A lot of people kind of discovered Tobey Maguire in um, Spider-Man, uh, and this was two years before. This was, I think, two years after The Ice Storm, which he also starred with Katie Holmes in. Which... If you're a Katie Holmes fan, though, just don't bother. She's, she's like, in it for five minutes. On a, on a like... Now, I like my references. I like my connections. Uh, Katie Holmes appeared in How I Met Your Mother as the, the slutty pumpkin. In this movie, she wears red cowboy boots. In How I Met okay. Your Mother... Ted is frequently seen wearing red cowboy boots. Now, I'm, I'm starting to wonder whether or not this was pulled from this movie for How I Met Your Mother. Maybe. Probably overthinking it, but it's, it's just in my head, that's how my brain works. So it's a nice little link for me, anyway. Well, yeah. So, obviously, you enjoyed Wonder Boys more than you did Sherry Baby. Two completely different yeah. movies. Yeah. Did they deserve their certified fresh ratings? Um, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say both did. I mean, I don't like Sherry Baby simply because I just I just found it unpleasant to watch. But I could appreciate what was going on in it. So yes, I could say it, it deserves at least the '60s somewhere on Rotten Tomatoes. Right. Maybe not fresh, but definitely the '60s. Wonder Boys. Um, I, I probably yet yeah, again early '70s maybe. I, I enjoyed it more, but I wasn't as invested into it as I have been with some of the other movies that you've pulled out. So, Well, that is the first double What's in the Box review for this week. Yes. And uh, I guess it's time to streamline straight over into our anniversaries. We watch them again all of the time. Oh, we get them on Prime for free. But we only know how old they are when we learn their anniversary. Ah, yes. Anniversaries. What other way to make us feel really old? Yes. We naturally have to start with our childhood and go back 40 years. Hey, what was that, Sonny? Yeah. Oh. I guarantee you've not seen this because I had to double check if I had actually seen this and I think it was once. I watched okay. it again this week. And I was like... It wasn't Battle Beyond the I Stars, was it? Try one. That's a hot dog. It comes from Earth. Do you like it? There's no dog in this. Mm -mm. <laughs> <laughs> no. Fortunately not. Robert Vaughn was in that movie. Jeez. Oh, yes, of course um, he was. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, no, it wasn't Battle Beyond the Stars. Um, can you believe, Steve, 40 years ago this week... Mm -hmm. um, a comedy movie by the name of Easy Money was released. Oh, no, this doesn't ring a bell. Do tell. No, it, it wouldn't. It's kind of, it's kind of obscure. Um, it was known as the movie that knocked National Lampoon's Vacation off the number one spot. Oh, okay? wow. And uh, just going into it, it was directed by a guy called James Signorelli. Mm -hmm. uh, he's well known as a director of Saturday Night Live and various skits and videos and stuff like that. He also directed uh, a movie called Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, starring Cassandra Peterson as Elvira in the mm -hmm. 80s. He was a director on Police Academy 2 as well. 
Okay. Probably one of my favorite ones of the Police Academy series. Um, this was um, a couple of years before Rodney Dangerfield had made his uh, movie debut in the much loved Caddyshack. Uh -huh. This was his follow up. So, this was the first time he was given top billing for his own movie. In this movie, it follows the Brewster's Millions uh, Life Stinks formula where uh, he is a compulsive gambler. And in order to inherit, I think it's his grandma's like vast fortune, he has to give up gambling. When I was watching it this week, it was like, no, nobody seems to drink anything but Miller beer. That's because they were sponsored. That's because Rodney Dangerfield was the spokesperson for Miller beer at the time. Who are you, what are you talking about here? Oh, uh... <laughs> as well as this. This was the first ever movie that Joe Pesci starred in as a comedy. There's a scene where Rodney Dangerfield is in drag. In full oh on drag. Oh, God. Yeah. Oh, their eyes were popping Which... out all over the place. The only time I was more affected was when I saw the movie Armed and Dangerous and saw Eugene Levy in assless leather chaps and John Candy in full drag. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's oh. that's... That's, that, that is an image that burns itself into your mind after you've seen it, isn't yes. it? Yes. And there was, there was a fantastic little cameo I spotted in, and good luck if you can find a clip on this, and I'm hoping you can. But uh, Joe Pesci's mother in this film is played by Catherine Scorsese. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that little old lovely dear from Goodfellas and yeah. Casino. And really? she doesn't have any dialogue whatsoever. She's just there in a scene, sat with him as She's his mother. Like, hey, this is my ma. This is my ma. Uh, and he is funny. Ronnie Dangerfield is really funny. Uh, and he's one of the only comedians who can be funny without saying a word. Just his mannerisms, yeah. the way he looks, his nervous tics and everything are, are fantastic. Uh, and this movie isn't bad. You know, it, it's, it's a nice little time capsule 40 years ago. Well, I've not seen this one, but I do know that Bruce's Millions, I think, was like the third version of that movie. The, the Richard the, Pryor one? Yeah, I think... The, the, also the, starring John Candy, but yeah, not in drag. I think there'd been uh, Hugh... What's his name? Hugh Cronwyn? So Hugh Cronwyn played the old guy yeah. in Bruce's Millions. He had I'm been not sure if he was in the original. Yeah, he was in a version beforehand, but I think there was one which was even further back than that. I, I think. believe, yeah, it was the third version. Walter yeah. Hill directed the Richard Pryor version. Yeah, of I love that film. Richard it's Which great. Is bizarre. Yeah. That is so out of his genre. I, I, I was shocked when uh, I, that was brought to my attention just recently. But yeah, 40 years ago, yeah. to start us off, uh, easy money. And uh, you can track that down. It's, it's worth a watch for a few laughs. Okay, well, in that case, what are we going to? We're going to go to 30, 20, 10? What are we going to? Uh, we're we're going to go to 30. And okay. uh, this has been all over Facebook. A lot of people have been talking about it. And funnily enough, Bill was talking about this with me the other night when I was talking to him. Hi, Bill. Can you believe Steve? Hi, Bill. Can you believe Steve? 30 years ago this week, The Fugitive was released. Oh, cracking film. Love this. I could watch this over Bullshit and over and over again. If the movie is set in Chicago, it's a good chance that Andrew Davis has directed it. Uh, if that battleship from Under Siege would have shown up in Chicago, you know for sure <laughs> Andrew Davis is steering that ship. Wait, he directed um, Under Siege as well. Yeah, right. You know what? You know what? There is a definite, there is a feel to both films, and I never realised it was the same director. That makes so much sense well, now. Not just like Tommy Lee Jones. No, not just Tommy Lee Jones. There's like an overall feel to it. Harrison Ford apparently really liked Under Siege. <laughs> which is scary when you think Harrison Ford likes the scenes to go movie. Which but, scene, um, Harrison? Mm. Yeah, so, so he said he wanted to work with Andrew Davis, and funny enough, this was the project uh, that came on. And Andrew Davis was a great director, and he, he kind of went a bit downhill when he did um, he did this movie called Chain Reaction with Keanu Reeves and oh, Morgan Freeman, yeah. which was not very good. Um, it, it was below par for him. And then he went on, I believe he did collateral damage with Arnie as well. That, that oh, that was that was dreadful. Uh, as you will notice throughout the movie, Harrison Ford has a very visible limp. Um, a limp what? Uh-huh. Hey! Hey! <laughs> <laughs> a limp hand on those flight controls. Um, 
No, he had a, a limp because uh, apparently uh, during the woods chase scene right at the beginning, he pulled a ligament. And instead of going and getting it looked at, he kept that injury all throughout the shoot. So uh, that's a, that is a part of it. It's not just a character tick at all. Um, okay. Obviously, this had probably one of the greatest stage train crashes in movie history. Mm -hmm. uh, so great that the wreckage of that train is still there in Dillsborough, North Carolina, at that spot to this day. They just couldn't be bothered clearing it up. No, sort of kept it as a kind of tourist attraction. Now they'd kind of do these tours, and I think yeah. when we get around to doing scene search, maybe we should just go. Yeah, um, just go there. Just I, mean, go I, there. I I remember there being a big thing about the um, the the dam dive. Um, yes. And they they were just showing off. Oh, we've got this really in intricate dummy. All the joints are articulated and they're all kind of motorized, and they'll all and they'll all do like this, that, and the other. And it'll be a most impressive dummy that you've ever seen. And then it just looks like someone doing that it when does. they dive off. <laughs> Nothing moves. Like... At least in like Temple of Doom, the arms were doing that. It looks like someone from Benetons was throwing a mannequin out the window into a skip. It does. That's the only way that I can. Yeah. Um, Great film, though. I love this movie. It is. I, it is I, brilliant. I, it is an amazing is. movie. Julianne Moore gets like top billing in this film, but she's in it for about two minutes. Thirty the seconds. Why, yeah. yeah. She was. She was heavily cut out of this movie. Apparently, she had uh, a lot of scenes, and towards the end, there's a bit of a romantic kind of kindling between well, Kimball and her but uh, they decided to kind of trim it all back uh, she kept her kind of top billing there mm -hmm. and she went straight from this small viewed role into this to getting get into with Jurassic Steven Spielberg Park. for The Lost World Yeah, Lost World, yeah. yeah. this was the first American film that was screened in Chinese theatres for over 40 years so this apparently uh, reignited the love of kind of cinema in China because mm. I don't think a you know, huge generations have not seen American mm. film in the theaters over there. No, because it would have been around um, about the weakening of uh, the, the communist grasp on China at the time, uh, which was kind of mirroring the same thing that was happening in Russia. Um, yes. But it wasn't as it wasn't as harsh as when it happened in Russia, from what I, from what I gather. Um, so no. yeah, either that or you know they also really really like Steven Seagal and then wanted to go. Oh look, there's the bad guy, and now he's playing the good guy. Let's see what happened. Well, well, well speaking of the bad guy, I don't. I think we can uh, kind of spoil it here. Obviously, one of the bad guys in it is played by Jerome Crab. Mm hmm. Uh, the the most chicken James Bond villain you will ever see in a James Bond movie in the Living Daylights, but um, and also the he, most chicken character in uh, Hot Shots Part Two as well. He's not in Hot Shots Part Two. He is. I'm you're getting people confused about, again, aren't I? Yeah, you're talking about Andreas Katsoulas. Yeah, one arm man. No, I'm talking about the other guy. Oh, um, right, okay. Well, J Jerome Crab um, actually replaced. The originally shot actor for that role. It wasn't uh, Kevin Spacey, which, was it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, not that week. Um, no, but it was. Rich, it was Richard Jordan. Uh, Richard Jordan was originally cast, and he had shot some scenes. Uh, he ended up getting recast with Sharon Crab. Uh, Jordan became too ill. He was dying of cancer at the time, oh, and uh, he had to drop out. I think the last movie he was in was a movie with Michael Bien called Time Bomb, which also had yeah. Patsy Kenza in it. And I think that was the last thing I saw Richard Jordan in. Uh, and what a phenomenal actor he was. Um, so, yeah, that was that's a, a really sad point. So we've never seen those scenes that were originally shot as his character, which is a shame. Um, also, a bit of history here. Would you believe, Steve, that this is the only remake of a television show that has been nominated for the best picture. Mm, I, I can believe that because most of the time, like even with things like the Adams Family, which was a huge hit, it still they still tend to be very kind of oh, it's from TV. That's that's not part yeah. of our world. But I think because this was such a big movie, because it had such a dramatic twist to it, because it has so many really good actors in it, I think they were willing to uh, 
to give it that nod. Yeah. yeah. Well, it could be argued that The Fugitive opened the doors for uh, the Mission Impossible franchise, mm -hmm. uh, for The Saint, oh dear, uh, for The Avengers, <laughs> starring Rafe Pines and... Oh dear. <laughs> yeah, it, it was all your fault, Fugitive. You we don't want to revisit happen. that Avengers, please, God, no. I mean, Irma uh, Thurman looked great in a cat suit, but that was the only good thing about that whole film. She's the only good thing about terrible movies. That's one thing I'll put about Irma Thurman. Yeah. Um, this also holds the record for the most amount of editors that were nominated for a single Oscar. There were six editors on The wow. Fugitive, and still to this day, that record holds. Interesting. Mm. Uh, for the year of 1993, this was the second highest grossing film of the year, trailing, mm -hmm. of course, Jurassic Park. Yeah, which I owned everything. It, it was it, this was a huge movie. Obviously, not as huge as Jurassic Park, but yeah, it was everywhere. It was everywhere. Well, I remember seeing a uh, a making of the the train crash that you mentioned earlier, and uh, and how it was all put together. And yet yeah, again, I've said this before in previous episodes. Learning how they do practical effects and mixing them in with uh, with visual effects is fascinating. Um, and just saying, oh, we do it in a computer, it's, it's, that's boring. I want the nuts and bolts. I want it to be greasy and dirty and and just full of people working to to like the edges of what is actually physically possible. That is interesting to me. So, yeah. Exactly. Couldn't have Love said it better myself. Uh, so yes, uh, this movie is worth it. Um, you're curious about Andrew Davis and like Andrew Davis films, this is probably his best. Um, obviously, Tommy Lee Jones scooped up the Oscar and has been repeating this character probably ever since for a decade. <laughs> Including last, <laughs> yeah. uh, last time's No Country for Old Men, yeah. The sound mix on this movie is incredible. Mm. I listened to it um, with my headphones on the other night. Incredible. Yeah. The, the sound is beautiful in this movie. So if you've got a good surround sound system, uh, crack out the fugitive. But yeah, so that was 30 sure. years. Um, what are we hunting in our next one? <laughs> okay. A uh, little bit out of left field, this one. Um, 20 years ago this week, I was at the cinemas to see this movie. And uh, I'd totally forgotten I went to see it. And it was the last time I saw it until this past week. Um, can you believe, Steve? 20 years ago this week, yeah, it was the Super Smackdown horror fans were waiting for Freddy, Freddy versus, versus Jason. Jason. Yeah. <laughs> I love this film. It is as you so mentioned earlier. schlocky. I love it. Yeah, as you mentioned earlier, you were a Friday the 13th guy <laughs> over a Michael Myers guy. Yeah. Yes, uh, Freddy versus Jason, the long-awaited and at some point, some version of it written by Cy Voris and Ethan Reeve out there. Um, but oh yes. yeah, of course I forgot they'd uh, they'd put together a draft of it. Yeah, yes. I'm not sure if it was the version where it was uh, Freddie turned out to be Jason's dad by banging Mrs. Voorhees. Oh, I don't um, know. There's been so many different versions of this movie. There's been so many different iterations. So many different directors. Um, and so many different endings as well to even the movie that we ended up with. Uh, endings where Pinhead showed up. There were supposed to be endings where Ash from Evil Dead showed up. There was supposed yes. to be uh, ones where the devil himself showed up and then was going to plot them as some kind of contest. There were loads of stuff going on with this movie. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's so many different versions of the script out there. Um, well, this was directed by Ronnie Yu. Now, um, for fans of uh, like uh, Chinese cinema, they will know it from uh, The Bride with White Hair uh, or Jet Li's movie Fearless, which is an incredible, incredible movie. Uh, and then when he came over, he obviously landed in doing horror films over here. So mm -hmm. uh, well, over in the US, he ended up doing Bride of Chucky. Mm -hmm. uh, which did very well that, for that franchise, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then obviously uh, moved on to Freddy vs. Jason. Uh, Ronnie wasn't originally lined up to direct this. Uh, originally, this was supposed to be, I believe, James Wan's first American film. Mm. Yeah, he was approached on this. He was very interested in doing it, but he had already committed to another little-known independent film at the time that most people thought, oh, that's not going to go anywhere, and it was called Saw. Saw, yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
No, I, I like this movie yet again. It is it is seriously schlocky. Um, but when you do end up with movies like this, um, even like Alien vs. Predator is probably the worst example of it. There is usually usually an effort to try and make them very, very accessible to a larger audience. So you will kind of dumb things down. No, this has got gore in epic amounts. There's blood squirting all over the screen. It's got some fantastic kills. Um, the the integration of both Freddy and Jason together makes sense. And what's weird is Freddy kills only one person in this entire movie. This was the last time that Robert Englund played Freddy Krueger. Yes, yes, it will be. Yes, it will he be. officially retired as the character. So um, yeah, he officially came uh, to, I think it was a Comic Con, and, you know, uh, he's decided out of his acting resume to pull Freddy out. We don't know how long it is till he pulls his Willie out. Oh. I do know that there was a lot of... <laughs> There's a V joke that you've never heard before. No. I do know that there was um, a lot of fan backlash over the fact that Kane Hoddle was replaced by Ken Kersinger. Because uh, yeah, Hoddle was... had been a very much a fan favorite because he'd done, I think it was seven through to Jason X, or it was six through to Jason X, one of the two, I can't remember exactly. And a lot of the fans had come to really, really enjoy him, and Ken Kersinger had shown up in part eight as uh, a guy that Freddy because... throws through a window. Yeah, I mean, it's because Kane Hodder is incredibly stocky, but he's not very tall. No, no, Kane Hodder is, and... uh, 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 sorry, Ken Kersinger has got like a good three inches on him, four oh, yeah. inches on him. Yeah. So they went for, wanted for a more imposing uh, kind of figure with him. Uh, so I, I can see why. Um, and unfortunately, this led to a, a bad version of A Nightmare on Elm Street being rebooted with the fantastic Jackie Earl Haley, who was originally um, auditioning for the original Freddy Krueger. And it was Robert Englund who took him to the audition and was waiting in the hallway and was asked, would you like to come in and audition? And Robert yeah. Englund ended up getting the gig. Yeah. So it was, jeez, Jackie Earl couldn't get a break to save his life. Um, there's a bit of interest here at Camp Crystal Lake stuff. Uh, this was saying, this was filmed at the same venue where they were filming X-Men 2. Yes, yes it was. At the exact same time. Yeah. So much so that the cast and crew of both movies were in the same hotel. <laughs> the no, same I didn't time. know that. I didn't know that. Yes. So uh, apparently Brian Singer, he who shall not be named, uh, apparently dropped by Singer the set Mort. of yes, <laughs> dropped by the set of Freddy vs. Jason to watch uh, the the fight scenes between uh, Freddy and Jason. Yeah. Uh, as you mentioned earlier on, yes, there were a number of sequel plans. Mm. One of them including Ash from Evil Dead uh, joining uh, the melee. Um, that did end up as a comic book adaptation, yes, I believe. Yeah, it did. Uh, yeah. Afterwards, uh, <laughs> done so many things where they wanted to do with the Evil Dead and bring them into things. It just never worked out. Um, the things I remember um, about this movie when it was kind of being shot and stuff, I remember um, the issue with Catherine Isabel. Now, Catherine Isabel, fantastic actress. Mm -hmm. um, beautiful. You might know her from beautiful. Ginger Snaps. Yeah. Ginger Snaps. Yes, she was. She hit it off big in this small Canadian independent movie, which is brilliant. It's a brilliant movie. Um, she had a no nudity clause, and she clashed with Ronnie Yu, who was trying to force her to do uh, a shower scene in this movie, and she wouldn't. And it became very public and very ugly, uh, and rightfully so. Yes, because definitely. if you sign a no nudity clause, you should never, you know, be threatened with your job or anything to do it. Uh, also. Uh, if you decide to go and revisit this movie, keep an eye out to see if you can spot Evangeline Lilly as an extra. Oh, is that in the the, cornf the cornfield party scene? In your dreams, you're lucky to be alive. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna have to rewatch that. Yeah, it's weird looking back knowing that there's a mesh of 17 scripts that they have basically just cut and pasted into one. <laughs> it <laughs> so works surprisingly so well in spite of that, though. It holds up quite well because you can't see the joins. 
the no. everything kind of makes sense. The whole idea of J of uh, Freddy bringing Jason up from hell to cause fear in the area that he'd been forgotten so that he can then gain more power and then go off on a rampage himself. But Jason isn't giving up the goat. That is a great little startup. And then the way that the kids kind of figure it out, everything feels very, very natural. I, I have that? to give credit to whichever writer came up with this scene. You mean you're not coming? It's not my fault. This bitch is dead on her feet. <laughs> 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 By the way, there is a, a very small Rey Mysterio cameo in this movie. So when uh, Freddy jumps out of the water, that is yeah. Rey Mysterio being sprung into the air. Um, oh, no. Just as Freddy Krueger. Okay, yeah. wonderful. Um, hi, Rey. Hi, Rey. <laughs> like you uh, watch this. Yeah. yeah. Hi, Rey. <laughs> you never know. Uh, it has a great score by Graham Revel, who also mm -hmm. did the score for The Crow. Uh, the Crow, so yeah. a great music soundtrack. Uh, the makeup and creature effects in this are brilliant. Yeah. They're, they truly are brilliant. Top of the game. Uh, Fred, Freddy's makeup stuff. looks fantastic. Yeah, they got they got the makeup right. Yeah. Um, and it's never been bettered again since. Uh, but yeah, Freddy vs. Jason, it's such guilty pleasure fun. It really from, is. From back when horror movies were fun. Yeah, it was, it was the sign-off for Freddy Krueger. And then, obviously, um, Friday the 13th gets rebooted, but in a really, really good way with yes. Marcus Nispel's 2009 movie. Yeah, and uh, what's his name? Is it is it Mark Meir who, who took over the, the role of Jason? Um, but yeah, I everyone rags on the, the, the uh, Nightmare on Elm Street reboot, but I absolutely love the way that they did the Friday the 13th reboot. I thought that was exactly yes. the way to go. Um, and as far as reboots go, I don't think they'd actually bettered it until Evil Dead when uh, yeah. Fede Alvarez um, rebooted that. I thought that was great as well. So it just goes to prove you can do these things. Not necessarily you should do these things, but you can do them and you can do them well if a little time and effort is applied to them. Usually we would have one for 10 years, but I'll just give it as an honorable mention. 10 years ago this week, uh, the movie The Butler was released uh, that was directed by uh, Lee Daniels, uh, Philadelphia no, director. One, no. uh, yeah, it, it's about the um, the butler who'd served something like eight terms as the butler of the White House. Um, uh, and it's a, it's a really good film, actually. Uh, we just don't, unfortunately don't have time this week to cover it, but you can check it out. It's a good movie. Well, that was uh, three, or technically four, movies that we discussed. I've got two this week, which isn't That's bad. Not bad. No, it's not bad. You can tell that the more mainstream ones, though, can't you? The Fugitive and Freddy vs. Jason. Come on. Yeah. Well, we're, we aim to change that by putting you in the realm of more diverse movies. Which means... What's in the box? What's in the box? What's in the box? What's in the box? God, you want to know something? We've been doing this now for... I'm, I'm not even sure what number this episode. Episode 89. I still don't get tired of hearing what's in the box. It's an immortal thing. I honestly theme. don't. Everyone is quoted as loving that tune. It was... Uh, Neil, you played Neil a Freddy. blinder, man. You played an absolute blinder. Yeah. So, uh, the new rules of what's in the box, Steve, while I'm rummage. Okay, well, it used to be that Andy would put out one movie that was certified fresh on Rotten Tomatoes that I hadn't seen for me to go off and watch before the next episode. But now he turns out that he's having to pull out two. The culprit behind who's given me two, I don't know. I suspected Jonas, but now I'm starting to think it might have been Bill Daly. Whoever it is, I shall have my revenge. But go again. Is this it? Every week you're just going to accuse a new person yeah. in the line. I'm going to accuse Joe next week, and then the week after that I'm going to accuse Kate, then Ethan, then your milkman. It was Kate, wasn't it? Ah, I saw that I little sideways glance would. right then. <laughs> I am on to you. No, no. It isn't. Okay, so, 
Um, basically, most of the movies are certified fresh or fresh uh, because it goes up and down sometimes with yeah. the box that I have filled. Uh, but I also threw in um, a bunch of what I call wild cards, which are certified rotten films from back when we were doing the, um, <laughs> the, the certified rotten version of our show in the last season, which we hated. Well, I no, hated. you hated. Um, I was I enjoying it. it because I had stuff like 8mm, which, you know, wasn't that bad. 47 Ronin, which was actually a lot better than people gave it credit for. And yeah, then I had stuff it. like, what was it? The Adventures of Hercules, which I laughed so hard at, I nearly bust a gut. Mm. You also had stuff like Captivity in Point Break remake. But um, yeah, we're just before boring. we get into uh, so there are occasional ones that I thought, you know what? This kind of deserves a watch. So I was throwing them in. So anyway, I'm going Changing to dig in for the first one. The place, huh? Can we have the music, please? Okay. The pick is out. And the pick says... Yes. Ooh. Oh. Oh. Oh, I, I know you haven't seen this. I know. Okay. Because we almost watched it together. And we didn't. Um... So I said, oh, we'll, we'll watch it again one day, and now we've got the chance. So we're going back to 1988. Okay. So we haven't been to the 80s in a while, so... Is it Action Jackson? It's fucking Action Jackson. How did you get that? You see? See? I do remember some shit. I do remember it. Okay. No, I haven't seen Action Jackson. But at least that, you know, it's going to be something which is a little bit different. You know, Sorry. I'm all... Is, like, is it a canon film? Bats? That's a Lorimar film, actually. Lorimar, okay. Which is uh, was Bill Daly's stomping ground at that time. So oh, yeah, will, of course he was, yeah. You know, I'll be able to get some uh, information on Axe and Jackson as we come in. <laughs> Love it. Okay, then. Brilliant. All right. That's a brilliant cast of all of your 80s renter villains are in that movie. It's great. Okay. Number two. Oh. Uh, <laughs> what? You're going to think this is such a con. And it's not. 100%. 100%. Uh, you are going to think I've rigged this, but I haven't. Steve. 1997. You're watching so. LA Confidential. You know what? I don't mind that. Well, you know, if you've not seen it, because you've mentioned a few times on the show you haven't yeah, seen it. Yeah, I've not seen it. I've not seen it. And it, it, yet again, like with uh, No Country for All Men, it is one of those movies which I've always intended to watch. But just haven't got around to it because, you know, I've said before, I like noir. I love that 1930s, 1940s kind of L.A. aesthetic with all the art deco and the fedoras yeah. and the suits and all the men look like men and they all had cigarettes hanging out of their mouths and all the women look like women. And it's all sleazy and there's nightclubs and, and just everyone drives around in gorgeous cars. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all for that. You got a double bill, Phil. You got a double bill of bill. Okay, double right, bill. fair enough. That 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 works for me. I'll quite happily so do a double bill of bill. Yeah, all right. Movies, I love Action Jackson. It's one of those movies you shouldn't love, but I love um, because it's so unapologetically great. Yeah, <laughs> no, um, I love eighties movies. I, I, there, there is a spirit to an 80s movie even the worst 80s movie and you know we were talking about this during the uh, the Wings House uh, episode and I, of course I had to pull out a load of footage from his movies which most of which were filmed in the 80s and just looking at them it's like wow yeah this, this really was it was a renegade time as far yeah. as the video store were concerned it was a wild west frontier it really was, and you could you you could just take potluck with anything on the shelf, and you could either hit an absolute stone cold classic, or you could hit something that was absolute garbage. But either way, you would be entertained. Yeah, yeah, we, we truly lost something great. We, we never did. knew we had. And then, obviously, we will be back with the LA Confidential and Action Jackson episode, uh, and then following that, who knows? Who well, knows? I know. We will have Mike Deesa, uh, animation director who directed uh, Dante's Inferno, great uh, film, Dead Space Downfall, great film. Um, also shows like Paradise PD, PD, great Black series, Races, The Simpsons, and uh, we love getting the animation people on because they are animated. They are really great, and Mike Deesa is a fantastic yeah. guest to come on, and um, 
we're really looking forward to that. Uh, so yes, and we have a lot coming up, so we need your subscriptions, people. Yes. And not only that, we also need you to get involved with the conversation, and the way you can do that is... Well, you can hit us up on the Tinterwebs. You can go to facebook.com forward slash Pottywood. You can get us on twitter.com because it's not even X anymore. I don't know what is going on. X. Uh, at it, It's at Pottywood. Whatever Elon Musk is deciding to call it this week, it's at Pottywood. Uh, you can actually get back in touch with us on the r slash Pottywood subreddit. It's back... It's back for some strange it, reason. It's back. I've been able to wrestle it back into control. It is back. Um, and you can also get us on LinkedIn. Uh, the address is far too long to memorize, so it's just there below. So, yeah, hop on, Excellent. get in the conversation, or even just like leave a comment below. Uh, for the price of a cup of coffee, you can go on Patreon. You can get our uh, Party Wood After Dark episodes. You can get audio episodes uh, of these just before the video ones drop. If you just mm -hmm. listen to them. Uh, if you cannot wait to get your party wood fix, then you can get them on yeah. there. Yeah, so it's not much. Uh, but for now, though, click the subscription, hit the bell, go to the Patreon, uh, and yes. But even if you don't do any of those things, we want to see you next time here on Pottywood. So for now, it is a goodbye from me. And I will catch you soon when I get back from Greece. I don't know what the Greek is for goodbye, so I'm just going to go, adios. Adios.